do I want you to focus on in day 15? So in day 15, I want you to focus on immune system and malignant disease. Uh, for those of you who are members, here are all the videos listed that I want you to watch. Non-members, this is what I want you to cover. Introduction to the immune system, azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, a summary to uh, a summary of the immune system and everything you've learned, an introduction to malignant disease, considering cytotoxic drugs, uh, methotrexate, tamoxifen, and summarizing everything in relation to malignant disease. I'm going to include some videos here, uh, free for you to watch, uh, that cover the immune system aspect of this chapter. This is a medium weighting chapter, uh, so it makes up 25 to 35% of the paper, all, all the medium weighting chapters, that is. Um, so this is one of the medium weighting chapters. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah and I'm going to be covering the part of the BNF chapter called the immune system. It goes under the whole chapter of the immune system and malignant disease. It's a medium weighted chapter for the registration exam, which means about 25 to 35% of the questions in the exam are on medium weighted topics. So there's a really high chance something in this presentation will come up in the exam. Let's jump into it. So let's have a quick overview of the BNF's immune system. So not the biological immune system. Um, if you're thinking of infections and that kind of immune system, that's a whole different chapter. So with this part of the BNF, we're looking more at autoimmune conditions. So that's when the body overreacts to its own immune system, which leads to different conditions. And so I've listed, I've listed a few of the common ones that are covered in the BNF and that are most related to the medication that we're going to talk about. So IBD, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and there's also rheumatological conditions like psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis. And also, we're also going to be looking at when patients get given a transplant, so an organ transplant or another tissue, when their body starts rejecting it, we give medications to suppress that rejection. So that's another condition that we're conditioned that we're going to be sort of looking at treating. One thing to know about this chapter is it's a bit different in terms of studying to something like the cardiovascular or the respiratory chapters where you're, you've got your conditions and you need to know the signs and symptoms of those conditions and the first line, second line treatments. Um, this topic is very specialist, so it's less about knowing what's first line, what's second line and the treatment pathways. It's more about learning the drugs and there's quite a lot to these drugs. So it's about really understanding the specific drugs in for these patients in real life. Most of them would be initiated on these treatments by a specialist and would get regularly monitored by specialists. So just bear that in mind, it's a bit different in terms of the content that you're taking in compared to some of the other chapters that you might have already covered. So moving on to the medications that we're going to have a look at, the main bulk of the BNF, BNF uh, that covers this chapter is immunosuppressants, which is going to be our main focus. We can also use cyclophosphamide as an immunosuppressant. It's actually a chemotherapy, but we won't really be touching on that in this presentation. Steroids are used a lot in autoimmune conditions, but again, that would go under the endocrine chapter. But we do use steroids a lot to uh, treat acutely unwell patients who are suffering from autoimmune conditions and would use IV methylpred or oral prednisolone to treat that. Methotrexate is also sometimes used for inflammatory bowel diseases. However, methotrexate will be covered in the malignancy presentation. So what we're going to cover in this presentation is immunosuppressant therapy. So the four main drugs in this category are azathioprine, mycophenolate, cyclosporine, and tacrolimus. And the last two drugs are narrow therapeutic index drugs. For the GPHC framework, they put these in a separate high-risk drug category where you're definitely going to get asked a question 
within each of those categories. So you're very likely to get asked something about either cyclosporin or tacrolimus, or maybe both. Let's move on. So let's start with azathioprine, which is indicated for Crohn's, the uh, treating the acute flare-ups and also maintaining remission, rheumatoid arthritis, and to rejection post-transplant, and myasthenia gravis, which is another autoimmune condition. So the mode of action isn't entirely understood, but what we do know is it reduces purine synthesis. Purine is a compound that we get from our diet, and it's needed to produce DNA and RNA. So by reducing the synthesis, we reduce the amount of white blood cells produced, and this helps to lower that overreactive immune response. For dosing, we give oral or IV, and dosing is generally between 0.5 to 3 mg per kg, either once a day or twice a day. There's quite a few important side effects to be aware of with azathioprine. Minor suppression is a big one, and it's common and also can be quite severe. It's also dose-related, so it depends on how much, how high of a dose we're giving. Um, which is something to take into account. So minor suppression is also known as bone marrow suppression, and it's where um, certain blood cells reduce in count to below the numbers that they should be. So this includes neutropenia, which is low neutrophils, and thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets. And we need to make sure patients are aware of the red flag signs to um, spot this. Uh, because we're giving an immunosuppressant medication, obviously the risk of infection is going to increase because we're sort of tapering down the immune system and the immune response. Another side effect is rare, but it's photosensitivity, which can actually lead to melanoma, which is skin cancer. So this one is really serious um, and really important for us to look out for, and again, to counsel the patient on. Hypersensitivity reactions are again uncommon, but if they do occur, it can be a reason to completely stop treatment and withdraw azathioprine. So um, again, we'd be given advice on how to look out for that. And then nausea, this is a common side effect, um, but not as serious. And it normally affects patients in the first few weeks of treatment and then they're fine. So the best way to manage it is to give anti-sickness alongside um, the azathioprine and see how they get on with it. And finally, as I mentioned, cancer, it's, it's rare and, well, the frequency is not entirely known, um, but it is something to for, as healthcare professionals, we should be looking out for. So melanoma from the photosensitivity and also there's been a link of lymphoma being more common with people taking azathioprine. One really unique thing about this medication, it's also it's the same thing for mercaptopurine, which is in the same drug group, is that before initiating treatment, patients have to get a TMPT level. So this is a thiopurine methyltransferase level. And basically, if your level is too low, you'll be extra sensitive to the myelosuppressive effects of the medication, which can increase your risk of getting bone marrow suppression. So it would be a reason for us to not start the medication. In practice, if the patient is under specialist care and really needs um, to start immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive therapy, it might be initiated once the level's been taken, but the results aren't back. But definitely for your exam, and um, on a ward-based level, um, you'd want to make sure you're checking that a level has been taken, that you've checked the level and the patient is within the correct range before initiating azathioprine. So a few interactions. Um, one is allopurinol. Um, it actually makes azathioprine more prominent in the body. So we've got to reduce the amount of the dose of azathioprine and warfarin is unsurprisingly, it kind of interacts with everything. So uh, azathioprine blocks the anticoagulant effect of warfarin. Therefore, we have to increase the warfarin dose. So on to counselling points, they're very linked to the side effects. So in terms of that photosensitivity and risk of melanoma, we would advise patients to use SPF, avoid direct sunlight and unnecessary UV exposure, so like using sunbeds would also be giving them the red flag symptoms to look out for for myelosuppression. So that's things like sore throats, mouth ulcers, 
getting an infection, of course, and unexplained bruising or bleeding. We'd also be getting them to look out for the hypersensitivity red flag symptoms as well. So dizziness, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle or joint pain, abdominal pain, kidney dysfunction. So that would be like um, changes in their urine colour, for example. So that's azathioprine. We're moving on now to methotrexate. And this is a high risk drug. So you will be asked a question about it in the exam. There's a lot to it. So let's cover as much as we can. And hopefully you'll feel like a methotrexate expert by the end of this. So in terms of indications, we obviously know it's used as a chemotherapy, uh, but it can be used for autoimmune conditions. So like rheumatoid arthritis, severe psoriasis and Crohn's disease. Its mode of action is it's a folic acid antagonist and this prevents cellular replication. So it has anti, so that's the part that um, makes it work as a chemotherapy, but it also has anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects, which are caused by inhibiting cytokines like TNF alpha and interleukin eight. In terms of formulations, it, there's multiple types. So it can be given IV, IM, intra, arterially, intrathecally, and subcutaneously, and of course, orally. So if we were given oral doses, it would normally be something like 7.5 to 20 mg per week. And the key word is week, it is given as a weekly dose when given orally. So methotrexate toxicity can occur. Therefore, folic acid five milligrams once a day should be given on a different day of the week. So as I said, the mechanism of action is that it's a folic acid antagonist. So to prevent the toxicity from occurring, the folic acid is obviously an agonist for the opposite. It has the opposite mechanism of action to the methotrexate, so it kind of counteracts it. Um, a good way to remind patients to take both every week, but on different days would be to say methotrexate on Monday and folic acid on Fridays. And then they know to make sure they're always taking it. Um, at the right day of the week and to make sure they're on different days. Obviously, if you gave them on the same day, the folic acid would counteract the methotrexate, so we don't want to be doing that. Methotrexate has a few um, MHRA alerts because there is a lot to it. So first of all, there's an NHS never event, which means that we should never, ever, ever be doing this at all. Um, because it has previously led to patient harm. So we should never give patients more than their intended weekly dose. The next point is that we would always dispense the 2.5 milligram tablet. So we're always given the same strength of tablet. That's because, as I said, the dose can be 7.5 to 20 mg. So you might think giving two 10 milligram tablets would be easier for the patient. But if their dose changes or if they were on a previous dose before where they were taking the 2.5 milligram tablets, it might be easy for them to get confused with how much to take. And then they might, might end up taking the wrong dose, which leads back to the first point of never giving them the wrong intended weekly dose. So that's why we always dispense 2.5 milligram tablets. And the third point, which we'll cover a bit later on, is a warning about their photosensitivity reactions that come as a side effect of methotrexate. So speaking of um, side effects, here we are with methotrexate side effects. So the first one is mucosal damage. So damage to the mucosal tissue, which includes a sore mouth, but also the mucosa in the GI tract, which can lead to stomatitis. Bone marrow suppression, which considering we're doing cancer care is unsurprising. As with all chemotherapy, it can cause um, bone marrow suppression and other blood disorders. So this means that there's an increased risk of infection and increased risk of neutropenia. Photosensitivity, as mentioned before, it's an MHRA alert. So we would give important counselling points to the patient. A rare side effect would be cutaneous reactions, so skin reactions, also pulmonary disorders, so pneumonitis, cough, shortness of breath, well, cough and shortness of breath are signs of pneumonitis, and also hepatic toxicity and hepatitis. So for monitoring, if we think about the side effects that I've just mentioned, we would do a full blood count because of the bone marrow suppression, the myelosuppression. We would check LFTs because of the risk of hepatic toxicity. And because it's really excreted, we would be checking UNEs 
to check renal function. In terms of interactions, one of the main ones to consider is the interactions with folate antagonists, so medications like trimethoprim and phenytoin, because um, methotrexate is also a folate antagonist, so it's going to have that synergistic effect. Clozapine also interacts with methotrexate, so that's something to be aware of. Um, we also need to cover pregnancy with methotrexate, so it's teratogenic and we would recommend avoiding pregnancy whilst on methotrexate. We advise patients to use effective contraception during their treatment and six months after treatment as well, and that's for men and women. Also for people at work handling the medication, so for dispensers and pharmacists, they should always wear protective gloves and goggles. So counselling points for methotrexate. First of all, it's looking for the red flag symptoms of bone marrow suppression, so telling patients to look out for mouth sores and ulcers, fever, flu-like symptoms, sore throat, unexplained bruising and bleeding. Also liver damage red flag symptoms, so nausea, jaundice, um, yellowing of the eyes and the skin, abdominal discomfort, dark urine. And then finally, counselling on photosensitivity, so advising them to wear sunscreen with high SPF, avoiding unnecessary direct light exposure, um, like going out in the middle of the day when we have an actual sunny day, <laughs> very rare in the UK, um, and also like avoiding sunbeds.